Welcome to the first in our series of Trinity Tomes Talks, where writers with a Trinity connection generously share their work with the wider college community. I'm Emma Sillett, the college librarian here at Trinity, and I am delighted to welcome, <laughs> well, some of you have already spoken to him, but to welcome our guest, our first guest speaker, Douglas J. Holiday, or J. Douglas Holiday, my apologies, who joins us this evening from his home in Virginia. Doug has been invited to talk about his book, Rethinking Success, Eight Essential Practices for Finding Meaning in Work and in Life, which you can see here. And it was published in the UK by HarperCollins in April last year. As a charity executive, investment banker, and former White House ambassador, Doug is well qualified to write about finding meaning in a successful career. And he has joined, he has drawn on his personal accomplishments and his professional relationships for this book. Doug has worked in the US State Department and for White House Chief of Staff James Baker III, and his career in public service culminated with his appointment as White House Special Ambassador, responding to South Africa's transition to multicultural democracy. After the White House, Doug went on to a successful career in finance, working in Goldman Sachs Investment Banking Division and founding two private equity firms. He remained a visible figure among US policymakers, advising presidents and debating public policy on national television. Doug has recently devoted more of his energies to nonprofit initiatives. He is the founder of Path North, giving CEOs the space to redefine personal success with peer support. He has also been involved in AVC Squared, that is Accelerate Brain Cancer Cure, a mentor, a project bringing together financial executives and disadvantaged young people. Somehow, Doug has found time along the way to gain degrees from the University of North Carolina, Princeton Theological Seminary, and our own Trinity College Oxford, where he graduated with an MLet in theology in 1982. He has continued his involvement in higher education and is now Heinz Christian Prechter Executive in Residence at Georgetown University where he teaches a popular MBA course. As well as writing this book, Doug has published on foreign policy, culture, theology, and 19th century history, contributing to books and writing articles for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today. With so much upheaval in our work lives and our home lives too over the past year, the insights from this book and from Doug's talk this evening couldn't be necessary, more necessary or more timely in my view. So now I'll hand over to Doug. Thank you, Emma. Uh, pleasure to be with you all. And thanks for the chance to share some thoughts with you about this book, why I wrote it. I never wanted to write a book, but uh, friends kind of encouraged me. And um, I, I'll probably during the course of this reference some pretty visible people and it's not to drop names. It's because if they experience this, the thought is, in my mind is, wow, if Lawrence Rockefeller gets lonely, maybe it's okay for me to be honest. So the key, I think, to everything I'm going to say is how I start the book, quote by Marcel Proust, Proust which says, um, the real voyage of discovery uh, is not merely to see, but to see with new eyes. And I think the problem with a lot of us Part of why our lives don't work is we're, we have the, we're, we're looking, as Einstein said, you, the paradigm that created the problem cannot be the same set of eyes that cause you to try to solve the problem. So I'm trying to get us to really reimagine and rethink how we should view everything. And so um, in this book, I cite a lot of people that have everything ostensibly you would ever think but there's a void inside. It's like T.S. Eliot called it hollow men, hollow people that are going through the motions of life, but life is just not working. So when I was leaving the State Department, I was in, interviewing with some investment banks. I'll never forget going up to New York and sitting with the head of the investment banking division, Morgan Stanley. So I walked into his office, cavernous office. He shut the door and you know, he said, I've read about you and wanted to learn about you. And I, I told him all, all the crazy things. He says, look, you've had a really eclectic career path. It's, it's wild. But he said, um, he said, it's really interesting. And then he looked at me and he said, my life, he paused and said, I'm in prison. 
It's a really nice prison, but I'm in prison. I have plenty of money. I could do anything I want, but I'm in prison. I'm, iso- I'm on my third marriage and I'm isolated from my oldest son. And then he said, how did I get here? I think that's exactly the right question to ask. Uh, how do we get there? How do we really get to a point in our life where life just doesn't make sense anymore? And um, so this book was written in my judgment to provide tools for people who are really wrestling with this existential question of meaning, saying, you know, I've kind of rung the bell or I'm, I'm hoping to ring the bell. The fact that you're at Oxford or you gone, went to Oxford gives you great advantages. So, so what is it that would really bring meaning? There was a guy named Jim, Jim uh, uh, Barksdale. He sold his company for billions of dollars. It's called Netscape. You can look him up. But it's funny, Forbes would ask him this question every year. How much money would make you really satisfied and at peace? In the first couple of years, it was five million. Then it was 100 million. Then it was 500 million. Then it was a billion. Finally, he, after 20 years, he was the fifth wealthiest person in the world. And they asked him this question. So you have billions of dollars. You Surely you're happy and satisfied and you're finding meaning. And he said, what's next? The, the writer said, he said, for one day, I'd like to be richer than Bill Gates. I mean, it's a fool's errand. Even the data suggests that chasing metrics of money, prestige, and power really don't deliver on the promise. It's it's kind of a fool's errand. So what I am suggesting is something really different. To try to look at your life, and one of the questions I say, what is the story you're born into? Because that story determines so much of you, how you view success, how you view a significant relationship, how you view what's enough, how you view peace, all of these subjects. So if you had a parent where it was never enough, if you got perfect grades but weren't one in your class, then you're always going to feel never enough. And so understanding your story, that we're all born into a story, which is a line I borrowed from a friend of mine, Peter Buffett, Warren Buffett's son. So let me tell you Peter's story. So Peter was at Stanford his sophomore year. He says, the only reason I got in Stanford was because of my last name. And he said, I'm sitting there and I'm a finance major. I hate it. Then my father famously announced he wasn't leaving me and my two siblings anything. And he said, that kind of sucks. <laughs> and then, then he went along beavering away. Six months later, his mother called him and said, Peter, your grandfather died and left you $92,000. That day, Peter got in his car, packed all of his belongings and left and started a journey that would take him into the world of music, which was his passion and love. So Peter, Peter went through this whole journey of trying to figure out who he was as the son of the great man. And um, it's interesting. He uh, eventually won part of an Academy Award for the score he did with Dances with Wolves with Ke- Kevin Costner and some other things. So I told Peter once, I said, Peter, in faith traditions, Muslim, Christian, Jew, there's something called, you know, it's, it has different names, but it's been virtually the blessing where a father comes along and says, or a mother to a child, whatever it is, significant other says, you have what it takes. You're enough. I said, did, did your dad ever do that? He said, funny you should ask that. He said, here I am. I was 62 years old. I was doing a music gig in Omaha. And I looked in the back. And there was my father and his business partner, Charlie Munger. And afterwards, my dad came up and he said, Peter, we've both been successful in our own ways. I said, Peter, you got the blessing. So step one, I'd say for a lot of us, is understand the story you were born into, because that's going to be the biggest driver in your life. If you, I asked my MBA students that I teach at Georgetown, I said, how many of you grew up in raging families? There was a lot of anger, about half raised their hand. I said, that's going to be your story unless you 
take a hard, sober look at it and pivot and change. So, so questions for you uh, in your private musings, which I hope you have a time of reflection and contemplation most days, but ask the question, how did my family view success? What, how much was enough? And if they weren't satisfied, pretty likely you're not going to be. So you have to deal with those questions so that you can have the life you want to have. If you never saw a whole relationship, you know, real love, pretty good chance you're not going to know how to do that unless you do the, do the hard work. So I'd say, you know, one of the first things I talk about in this book is the story you're born into. The other is related to it is the audience. David Reisman wrote a, book, wrote a book, he's a Harvard professor in 1960 called The Lonely Crowd. Talked about the audiences in our life. If you're a Hasidic Jew, how you dress, your politics, who you're married, 90% of your world is pretty much circumscribed. Same with if you're an Amish or Mennonite or some other group. So what is, who is your audience? You know, Brene Brown teaches at the University of Texas. She said an interesting thing. She said, being yourself in a world that's trying every day to make you everything but yourself is the bravest thing any of us can ever do. So I would say understanding our story is really, really a powerful thing. Understanding our story and then understanding what audience are you living to please? Is it a parent that you could never please? Is it an uncle? Is it a school proctor? Who is it? What is your definition of, of happiness and are you ever gonna get there? Uh, and so you have to figure out who your audience is. And simply put, I, I like what the Quakers said. The Quakers had a really interesting formulation. We should all tattoo this on our wrist. It said, we should live to please an audience of one. Whether you define that as yourself or God, wouldn't that be the ultimate liberation to say my audience, period, is, is who, myself or above. And, you know, you can look at why people don't do that. Why did our U.S. Senate, they all knew that Trump was despicable and deserved impeachment. These are a lot of my friends. Why didn't they vote to impeach? Because their audience is getting reelected. They're just pleasers. And I understand that. We all have those drivers in our life. But you have to figure out, you know, that thing. The other thing I'd put on the table for you to consider is Vivek Murthy, who was our um, uh, Surgeon General, you probably have the equivalent in the UK. But before COVID, when he was Surgeon General, he named not obesity and not smoking, but loneliness is the greatest public health crisis in America. According to the UCLA Loneliness Index, one out of two people self-report they're lonely and disconnected. There was an Inc. study of 3,000 CEOs. Of the 3,000, half of them self-reported that they feel lonely and disconnected. Of that half, 67% said they have no one in their life they can trust. Do you think that affects how you run a company? or if you're a politician, if you have no one to trust in your life. Uh, I remember Theresa May a few years ago appointed, this sounded crazy to me, but I tell my class, a minister of loneliness to the cabinet because of the UK crisis. And I read about some, this one police officer, uh, I forgot where it was, Brighton or someplace, but this police officer, a woman, was investigating this fraud of this 85 year old woman. <clears throat> she kept giving money to this young man. She went to see him and said, why did you keep doing that even when you knew he was stealing money from you? And it ended up being about 40,000 pounds. Oh. <clears throat> and she said, if I didn't talk to him, my phone would never ring. So this police officer, you can look this up, <coughs> started something called the chat bench. It's in about eight cities, I think in the UK, where in the park, there would be a bench. If you just wanna to talk to somebody, you sit there. <coughs> so, it's, um, 
So this is a, a very interesting challenge. And part of the problem is so many of the mediating structures we used to look to for connection, the extended family, <clears throat> the church, the um, school, you know, alumni associations, you know, civic organizations, all the things that the Talkville said, that was the unique secret sauce of America. They're pretty much gone. Robert Putnam wrote a book, Harvard professor called Bowling Alone. He uses bowling as a metaphor. He said, if you go to a bowling alley or a movie theater, most of the people are alone now. I would have never thought of doing activities like that when I was a kid alone. Now half the people do. We simply don't have this connection. This is a crisis. And we need to find, so, so the question is, how do, you, how do you address that? I've been a couple of small groups. I'm going up to New York tomorrow. I, I, I started with the former head of Goldman Sachs, a small group for CEOs. 25 years ago, we meet on the Upper East Side at the Lynx Club. <clears throat> and we talk about meaning. It's not a religious thing. We talk about meaning. We'll have a, an article we'll read by some thought leader and we'll just discuss it. And people feel a connection with one another. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So, so I would suggest if you don't have a few close friends, you know, seek them out, find a small group. The data that I've seen, and I always depresses my MBA student because their average age is about 29 or 30, starting from 30 to 45, you start shedding relationship. By 45, if you're lucky, you'll have one or two friends. Or acquaintances. We are made for community. We're made for this kind of connection. So there's a lot of stuff I have in this book that we can talk about. I'll just mention the other, the other areas because during the Q&A, you might want to talk about them. But I talk about, you know, there these illusions of success, knowing your story, uh, audience, maintaining genuine relationships, making gratitude a part of your life. Neuroscientists tell us now that gratitude actually affects the brain. You don't have to make a list of the things that suck in your life, you know those, but you have to really focus on the things that are working. Uh, the, other, the other thing is learning to forgive and serve. If you don't forgive, if you're holding a grudge in these things, not forgiving is like drinking poison me in effect expecting you to die. You know, Confucius said, when you go on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. Service, where are you giving your life back to? Risk, risk is hugely important. If you're not risking, you're not growing. This is why so many older people, you know, wither up and die. They are living life to not get hurt and playing it safe. I don't care what form it takes, but we all have to keep risking. And the last thing is, uh, the last two things, one would be living an integrated life where everything fits. You have meaning in work and in your private life, you aren't just working to live, but you're living to work. Everything makes sense and is one integrated whole. It's interesting, young people now are saying, we will take less compensation if we can be a part of companies that stand for something, that have a purpose beyond profits. And then the idea of leaving a legacy, however you look at this, it's never too late to really figure out what do you wanna leave? Uh, I think it's at Merton College. There's a, there's a bench there, I think, with a guy named Cockrell's name on it. According, and it says, it simply puts, it says, he, he only lived to be 25, but it said he did all that he could. And I puzzled over that forever. What did they mean? And then I thought, that's really all that any of us can be expected to do. That's your legacy. Just doing all that you can with the resources, with the giftings you've been given to really make a difference. You don't have to compare yourself to anybody else. And it's never too late to leave a, a legacy. So I want to leave you with one more thought, then I want to open it up. And the thought is this, you know, there's a lot of people talking about happiness and blah, 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 and all these books on happiness. I am not a big fan of happiness. 
I think happiness is utterly overrated because it's circumstantial. I got a raise, you know, I have a new partner in my life. You know, my kid got in a great school. These are all circumstantial, they come and go. What you wanna drive for is meaning. Meaning is the secret sauce of life. Viktor Frankl wrote that little book, uh, you know, where he describes logotherapy, man's search for meaning. He was a psychotherapist in one of the Nazi death camps. He understood that the people who had a life of, as Aristotle called it, thriving, were not the physically robust, but those who had a purpose beyond their circumstances. If you doubt me on this, I, before some of you got on the call, Guy was talking about his son going out. If you doubt me on the difference between happiness and meaning, let me give you an example for those of you who have children. I have three boys. Is that a happy experience raising three boys? I'd say, well, kind of yes, no. If you turn the question around and say, is that a meaningful experience? Oh my gosh, most meaningful thing I've ever done. Don't chase happiness, it's an illusion. There's already always someone more successful, better looking, wealthier, more accomplished. But meaning is about something in, in your internal life. So, um, so with that, uh, you know, and, and you know, we could talk about technology. We can talk about all these things that are causing, you know, generating so many of these problems. But I'd like to open it up for anybody that wants to challenge me, ask me a question. You can do it in the chat or you can ask me. I really, I'm, I'm good. And nothing's kind of off limits. So there we are. That was a random smorgasbord into my alleged brain. Guy, did you have something? Or were you just waving? As you, as you can see, I didn't multitask at all. You had my complete attention. See, so I, I, that, was a, that was a challenge for me. I said, if I can <laughs> keep this good looking guy on the call, I, I can go someplace. <laughs> and you know, I, I, if you were if you were there in '82, we must have been there at the same time. So that's that's oh. that's something we didn't engage before. Um, yeah. Doug, thank you. I really en enjoyed it, and I can't wait to read the book. I'm looking forward to it. Um, the the thing I was going to pick up was on purpose. So my firm is a uh, is a um, what we call a multifamily office. So we look after oh. multi generational families, and sure. one of the things that we major on with them is governance and succession and trying to ensure yeah. that they understand purpose, that whatever that legacy means to them, that they can create it. It's not just about wealth, as you say, it's all beyond that as well. Um, so we talk about a, a lot about purpose. We believe in it very, very fully. Uh, we try and engage with or get families to engage with purpose because that way we think that they'll be more successful whatever that means to them so all of these stems around but so I'm, I'm thinking less about families perhaps than the corporate environment which is where yeah. I become a little more cynical so yeah. how uh, you, your, your comment on the fact that um Perhaps the, the younger generation, however we badge them, are prepared to trade um, salary and uh, remuneration for, you know, for working for a company, whether it's a B Corp or some other company that has got the yeah. right. Do you think that whether it's Corporate America or Global Corp Inc. Um, embraces purpose as a cynical means of uh, of attracting the best talent or do you think that actually the executives that you've encountered genuinely believe that businesses are better if they're more purposeful guy that's a great great question and i think it's a mixed bag frankly i think some of them see the handwriting on the wall like nasdaq now requires that they have diverse people on their board, a woman, person of color, whatever. I think this whole idea, the Milton Friedman idea of shareholder premacy is give, given way to stakeholder premacy, that there are, there are many stakeholders, including the employee. Johnson & Johnson has been doing that since the 30s. If you, you know, in my class, I have 
three mission statements. I have Goldman Sachs, uh, Enron, some of you know the huge scandal and meltdown, and then John, uh, Goldman Sachs, Johnson & Johnson. I take away the names. By far, the best written mission statement is Enron, except that they didn't live it. Now, I believe there is uh, a rethinking, a reimagining, because th there is an existential crisis among leaders. I work at both ends of the food chain. And Guy, you ought to look at Path North, look at our website, because this could be something your folks would enjoy. But I work at both ends and I find these young MBAs are asking the same question. What is meaning in life? What'll bring me satisfaction? And also the people that have made it. Those two are asking these really profound questions. So I think there's a level of honesty and I think COVID has unmasked some of these issues that have always been there, but people are, are brave enough to finally be asking these. So there's a great article I'd, I'd commend to you it's in the Harvard Business Review, it was two years ago in August. It's entitled, When Work Has Meaning. It is really interesting because they talk about KPMG. It was number five in the league tables in terms of successful consulting companies. A new CEO came in. He did the following. He asked everybody there to define what their purpose is beyond making money for their client and themselves. So if you were in aerospace, you were helping them create a sonic jet that is protecting freedom in the world. Whatever the purpose of this, when you're working with a client, they had to do it. And they had to put these stickies on their cubicle or their desk. They had to be prominent. Where everyone asked them about it, they do it. They started talking about purpose all the time. What is my purpose in being here? What is interesting? In a year, they went from number five to number one in the league tables. Why? As you know, in consulting, the biggest expense is training. People didn't, don't want to leave KPMG now because they feel like it stands for something. So that the costs to recruit and train have gone way down. So anyway, and I think people talk about it. People love discussing it. And they lo love being proud of their firm. When I was at Goldman Sachs, before we went public, I think it was a different firm. People love the culture and what was going on there. So I think these these things are a real value and value added to companies if they do them right. Now, there are the cynical types. I don't know, BlackRock is talking blah, blah about this. I don't know if they mean it. But, you know, there are, a, I have to tell you, a lot of CEOs. I'm having dinner with two, 10 of them tomorrow night in New York. These people are for real. I've spent time with most of their companies, with their clients, and they are saying, you know, we want to be in your life and provide something beyond helping you with all the metrics of success classically defined, because it's got to be something more, you know. Sorry, I talked too long on that question. Anybody else? That's quite all right. We've got a couple of questions in the chat. We've got one from Theo saying, Doug, very interesting comments. Thank you. There is potentially quite a large difference between living to make oneself happy versus making God happy. Can you elaborate a little on this Quaker rule and how to navigate this distinction? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in an atheist family, so I, I came to faith intentionally. And so many of my friends, they, they, it's like G.K. Chesterton said, people have not rejected faith, but rather a poor caricature of it. I think so many people say, oh my gosh, I had this nun or this and that. I didn't have any of that, thank God. So I came to it, you know, when I was about 20 and it's really interesting, but I bring the eye of the cynic and the eye of the simple believer. So my view is this, I think we all have an audience, that void is gonna be filled in some way. And I think you gotta define, you know, who or what it is. I think for me, God is the most liberating audience, but I feel like at the end of the day, if somebody says, if you say, Emma, you know, my audience, I just want to be, have meaning in my own life and stop trying to live the life my mother wants me to live or some other, or the culture and society. 
which is with social media, that's where so many young people are getting their sense of well-being today. So I would be happy with either of those. <laughs> or if so you would say I, either. <laughs> Subras also has a question. On the question of loneliness, do you think it's a new problem or is it that we talk now about feelings in a way that we or society didn't before, or at least didn't so much? And whether this is new or not, what can we do to address it? That That's brilliant. I, I think loneliness is certainly not, you know, not a new phenomena. Pascal and Ponce's talks about the God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each people. You know, T.S. Eliot talked about hollow men. So there is a sense we can be hollow and empty, and that's always been there. I think the difference is what Putnam pointed out in Bowling Alone, that the mediating structures, there used to be a sense of neighborhood where people would live there for a long time. I grew up my, in, in Washington, a lot of my relatives were within two blocks. We would play on the weekends and do things together. That's gone now. My one sister's in San Francisco. I'm in Washington. So, so I think for most people, the neighborhood's no longer that, that support system. The church for many people used to provide that link to a community. That's not there. I think clubs, you know, private clubs that used to be, you know, and I don't mean this elite club, just any kind, the elf clubs, whatever it is, sporting clubs, whatever, they used to provide something. So I feel like the a business is about the only place where people find some, some kind of connection. And I, I believe, though, there is such a hunger for this that I believe I've started a bunch of small groups in my life. And I think there are so many people, it's almost like when somebody risks it almost and says, you know, I'd love to have a group of friends that where we could every now and then talk or maybe read a book together, do something that's not just about the weather or sports or whatever, but to talk about something that really matters. And that's why in our group in New York, we actually read an article that has meaning. And that gives us the jumping off point. But we're all made for this. We are all... Uh, you know, and I don't care what level. I remember I used to stay with Lawrence Rockefeller in his beautiful place on Fifth Avenue. Remember, we're having a, a bottle of Bordeaux one night at his place. And I said to him, I said, Lawrence, so what, what is it like to be a Rockefeller? I'll never forget what he told me. So he's not with us, so I could mention this. He's died. He said, I have this reoccurring dream that I'm at the bottom of a well. And I'm looking up and my father and John D. Rockefeller are up there. And I'm trapped. I'm trapped by expectations. I'm trapped by my name. And then he, I never heard this term, but he said, no one cries crocodile tears for you if you're Rockefeller, but we have problems still. Everyone is trying to figure out, as Freud called it, the riddle of life. What in the hell are we here for? That's, that's been the Greeks everybody's looked at this riddle, but I think modern society has really exacerbated. I mean, I think, I think social media has worsened it, but I have a great cartoon from the New Yorker and it kind of makes the point about everybody has blamed like in the forties when, when the telephone came about, there was all these articles written about this is the end of the family. Oh my gosh, here we go. So I have, a, I have an article that was in the New Yorker and it has a group of cavemen around the table and uh, they look, one of them looks at the other and says, we used to talk before we had fire because they have a big fire pit going on. But you know, everybody blames technology, but I really do think it's a different era where so many people are creating a persona that has nothing to do with reality. And everyone, it's like, it's like this one author said, um, everyone is trying to live up to everyone else's perceived greatness, you know? And it, it's, it's all perceived, it's all perception. And the suicide rate among young people is absolutely staggering and growing. And it's because they feel like they're not enough. The shaming culture is going on. There's lots of things. I have a friend, a doctor up at Harvard, who has a clinic 
they treat nothing but uh, problems related to technology. You know what the number one problem? It'd be an interesting discussion to have, but number one problem according to him is sleep deprivation because young people never turn off their technology. So all night they're hearing these buzzes and, and sounds and they never go into deep REM sleep. So, so it's interesting. They are, you know, and then he said something else, uh, age 23 and below, one of the three best friends of people age 23 and below are somebody they've never physically met. <laughs> so I don't know what to do with that, but it just belies something much more profound. And I, I would say there's no substitute for real connection with people, heart to heart. And uh, yeah. Still to be solved then, a bit of a, an intractable problem, but interesting to uh, know it was kind of ever that in some ways. Well, there are, there are, there are, Emma, um, lessons. There are, le there are principles that are older than time. You know, the literacy, literature, there used to be so much litter going back to Pericles about friendship. It was written about, sung about, talked about. There's so much literature on real friendship and why it's valuable and important. I have a couple more questions in the chat. Yeah. I have one from Zen Rong Yap that says, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about responsibility. What do you think of that? And what do you think of him? Uh, he's a strange dude to be, I know him. We, we, we've spent some time together, but I think he's been going through a hard time in recent months, uh, but personally, but I think his book's interesting. I can't believe how it exploded you know, pretty dense. And he's a very controversial academic for those of you who don't know him. But I think he makes some good points, you know. Um, it's always different when you meet, when you know somebody and you see their writings, you know. Um, but, but I think he's helped some people, but I, I don't know if he'll ever, uh, where, what he's thinking these days. I mean, I always feel like with every book, we ought to have something on the back that says, does this work in this person's life? Because <laughs> there's so many people that are talking about things and you say, does that really work? <laughs> Is that <laughs> A money back guarantee, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I have another question from Eleanor F. He says, you've spoken a lot about wealthy individuals and I have a question for you. How would you approach finding meaning and fulfillment for those who are systematically marginalized and brutalized such as trans women of color in the US? Yeah, I think, I think whatever causes you to be isolated and disconnected, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a different flavor, but it's exactly the same thing. You know, a middle school principal can feel utterly alone. You know, uh, a trans person can, all these. It's, it's um, you know, I think part of it is we, you know, we, part of it we project it on ourselves and part of it the culture does. And um, I, I think freedom comes through being authentic. People don't want you to be, uh, you know, they don't, they don't want you to be perfect. They want you to be authentic. Authenticity is the game changer in my mind. And authenticity comes from being real about your warts and all. So, so let me give you an example. Um, the first day of my class, I always say to my students, the point of identity, your point of identity with everybody you ever meet is not how rich, successful, whatever, it's your broken parts. It's the parts that aren't working. It's your insecurities. So this young man on the front row, this is, now remember, this is the first five minutes in the class. And it's really hard to get in this class. So this guy says to me, says, Professor, I have something I want to say. I said, okay, sure. He said, um, 
I have had a debilitating stutter my whole life, which caused me to live in the margins. I had no friends. I couldn't put one sentence together without stammering and I would be humiliated and laughed at. So I've never had any friends, but I was very strong academically. So here I was sophomore year at an Ivy league school and I'm going to take my life. Now he's telling the class this the first five minutes and he said, I'm going to take my life. But before I do, I'm going to go out because I'm going to be dead tonight. Anyway, I'm going to tell people what it's like to be me. How humiliating and bad. So he went out and two things happened. The more he talked about how his stutter was debilitating, he didn't have any friends, blah, blah. The more he did this, other people started to share their broken parts and their insecurities. And they started to feel a connection with them. And then I remember he paused like for dramatic effect in the class said, professor, guess what? He said, I am the student body president of my MBA class here at Georgetown. I have to give speeches all the time. This being real and authentic connected him. So I being the smart ass that I am, I said, so how many of you, you know, our friend here just told us some things. You're, you're a class of winners. He's obviously not of your caliber. We're gonna take a break. How many of you wanna get on the register and transfer out of this class? Obviously, no one raised their hand. I said, how many of you feel safer because of what Clark shared? They all raised their hand. I said, if you learn nothing else, your point of identity, people don't want you to be perfect, but real is good enough. And I tell you, it will change everything. Authentic people always belong in the room. People that are faking that they're perfect never do. <laughs> Can I respond to that? Yeah. Okay, so I see a point about authenticity and I completely agree with it. However, there's a point where even if you are your authentic self, you're not wanted in the room. Yeah. I'm a trans person. I used to teach. Uh, I got regular death threats for teaching as a trans person in the West yeah. Country of England. And I, could, I was living authentically. I was being myself. I was unashamedly being myself. And yet I still had to leave that job. Yeah, I found it. Uh, a, I found it a fulfilling job, but I was systematically forced out of it, and that's yeah. more what I guess I was going for. Was if you have a group of people who are systematically marginalised, brutalised, they're not allowed in the room, no matter how authentically they're living. You know, their options are taken away from them. How can you really live to your yeah. full potential? And I wondered if you have any thoughts about no, that. I, that's more no, what I was going for. But number one, thank you for your candor. That's that's fantastic. Number two, I think you need, I need, you need, I think we all need some place that's beyond the workplace where we can really be real about our pain, about our longings, about our hopes, about our disappointments. That is really, really important. That has nothing to do with work. This is something abiding in your life. Now, I think you're right. I think I've been on the Morehouse board where Martin Luther King went, all male, African-American school in Atlanta. And I did this, Eleanor, for this reason. I wanted to know what it was like as a privileged guy like me to be in a situation where I was the only, you know, <laughs> Caucasian on the board and would do that. That was fantastic for me. So I, I think, I think uh, you know, you look at race in some ways, the conversations going on. I don't, I think that's it. You know, your issue is in the queue, but I don't think it's there yet. But I think race finally is, in America at least. And But I think in the meantime, you need to have a holding room where you can, you can have support and learn how to risk, where is the appropriate place to risk? Because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to just do stupid things where everything blows up and, all the time. You, you, you want to be wise. You want to be wise. And uh, particularly, you know, I can't imagine the pain you've experienced with that. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. But I see leaders like Joe Biden is giving voice to this. You know, finally, we have a leader starting to say some things that matter. And uh, but it's it's hard. It is. It's um, really hard. I think this notion 
I think, I think the insecurity of people, unless they get grounded themselves, they always need the other. It's the Muslims, it's the blacks, it's the trans. It's, it has nothing to do with you. And that's where you can't personalize it. It's all about how messed up I am, that I need to have someone to put down. It's terrible. But thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question and great response. Does anybody else have any more questions? I've got a question, if that's all right. So, uh, sorry if you can hear Samuel in the background, my little <laughs> month old. Um, uh, I don't know if you can, but. Uh, yeah, I uh, so I've read, I've, I read Good and morning. enjoyed enjoyed your book, Doug. Um, you say in it about how important you think travel is um, for people to experience other cultures and um, learn about other other people and other other ways of doing things. Um, obviously, we're not really allowed to travel at the moment. How much do you think that's going to have a lasting impact on young people, all people of different ages, you know, not being able to go and see different places? Yeah, I I want to believe that it's there's a pent up demand. I was listening to a CEO of a um, large hotel chain. He said they're getting reservations, bookings are going. I mean, I think people are anticipating by the by summer things are going to change. Now, whether they do or not, I mean, I'm traveling. I was in uh, Charleston last four days. I'm going to New York tomorrow. Then I'm going to California. So, so some of us are moving about, but I am. I think, um, yeah, I think it gives you different eyes when you go into a culture. And I think it's, it's telling that I think only half of the members of our Congress, the US Congress even have passports. So if you aren't exposed to different people, to, to challenges, uh, I mean, to wonderful cultures, the richness of it, you're gonna be fearful of it. And you're going to buy into narratives that are just so crazy and not not honest. So, so I think I think it's I think travel is really essential. It really opens your eyes to everything. Fantastic. So I think I think we're coming back. I mean, I think it's inherent in us to want to venture. I you know we if we had time we could talk about risk because I think that all comes in. To risking. If you're not risking, you're. I don't think you can live a life unless you keep growing and risking. A great, a great uh, YouTube video to look up is the oldest yoga teacher in the world. She just died last year. I think she was 97, and she was still teaching yoga in Connecticut. But what I love, part of this little video about her, at. 88, she took up ballroom dancing. Oh my God. And it wasn't like tottering around. This woman was killing it. It was like, are you kidding? So I'm not suggesting that we all do that, but in little and in ways, we need to keep pushing ourselves to think differently, to read more broadly, to meet people that are different to us, go places that we haven't, take a risk where we might be living or I don't know. I, I just think that's really important uh, and it's inherently the way we're made. That's great. So all of you come visit me in Washington. <laughs> if nobody else has any more questions, I had one that I've been desperate to ask you. So you talked about seeing things with new eyes and in your book as well, it seems that living your life in a very intentional way is very important and not living on autopilot. So my question is, how do you develop habits of self-reflection, say, and make that a regular habit that helps you detach from your existing ingrained habits? That, that is a, uh, that's a great question, Emma. And I would think, you know, if we're, if we're, quote unquote loss, which I think a lot of us have been, particularly over this year. I think step one is to acknowledge it, be honest that I'm feeling lost, existentially I'm feeling lost. So how do you, how do you, what do you do against that? Number one, create space in your life to feel, to feel and think. Put down, put down those things. 
And then I have a bunch of questions on the website of, for Path North that you can look at and start asking yourself a question, maybe a question like this. What are the constraints holding you back in your life? What are they? Just name them. Part of naming these demons changes. The first thing in the book of Genesis that, you know, God asked Adam and Eve to do was to name the animals. Why? Because in Hebrew culture, that's how you get power over something, by naming it. A lot of us don't create space in our life to name the demons. So you need to have, create space. So my, I'll tell you my little practice. I, I sit there and I um, try, I, I don't make it every morning, but I, I shoot for that. I sit down, I have Gregorian chant on and I just still, still myself and breathe. And then I make a list of five things that I'm grateful for. At the end of the year, I have about 1,500 small things. It could be a dark roast cup of Italian coffee. It could be, doesn't have to be big, but it changes your mindset. Then I just go through some spiritual disciplines and think about, do I need to forgive myself or anybody for anything? I, I kind of identify the, you know, what I'm imagining could be a new new life for people I care about. I, I think about that. I write down in my journal, maybe a, something that's perplexing to me. Um, I think learning, you know, Pascal said again in, in Ponce's in 1666, he said, the fundamental problem of a person is never learning to be alone within four walls. Now think about that. Never learning to be alone within four walls. So what I've been doing for a long time, uh, I take about 16 leaders to a monastery where they actually chant still. Now, most of these are not people of any faith. Some are atheists, some are agnostic seekers. But for two and a half days, no one speaks. We eat together, no one talks to one another. We can go to the services where the monks are chanting, you can do that if you want. The only thing that's required is we start together and then we end. At the end, everybody shares what that experience was like. It's really powerful. When you learn to be alone, something takes over. You have a new confidence in your life. So it's funny, these are not new disciplines. They're new to us because we're busy being busy. And we're so terrified to be alone that we keep filling our lives with stuff and things and activities and learning to create space to be still and actually learning what surfaces in me. What is the anxiety? What's the fear? Name it. Name it. Well, thank you for your response. It's interesting to hear as well about the value of solitude as opposed to loneliness and the distinction yeah. between those they two. are very they're very different things solitude is breeds wholeness loneliness is something very different it's almost an existential pain loneliness but solitude enables you to be with others in a healthier way and to be with yourself in a healthier way i have another question from eleanor she says, you've spoke a lot of forgiveness and its importance. And I agree that forgiveness is an important part of the human experience. But do you think it's always necessary for meaningfully moving on from a difficult experience? Well, I think uh, I thought the question I thought she, where she was going to go was more in the direction of. Can you forgive someone that will ne never acknowledge wrongdoing? I think you forgive not for anyone else's sake, but your own letting go. And only, you know, if that issue that being harmed is, is just debilitating you. I know people who have lived the life of, well, we had a president of grievance, always angry at everyone. Just, I think it just destroys the soul and who you are as a person. 
So I think letting go is really useful and important, but I think this is, everyone has to find their own way on this. I think they do. I think there's, there's no easy answers to this, but I tell you, we had a, an annual Path North gathering in Charleston, South Carolina, and we, we took people to the church where Dylan Roof shot and killed those people. It was a black church, killed nine people. We took them down there and we sat in those pews, about 200 people. We heard from parishioners who went to the sentencing of Dylan Roof and unscripted said they forgave him. Unbelievable. <laughs> and people in our crowd that were there, the Pathner people, some of them didn't know how to deal with that. They said, that monster, you can never forgive him. And they were just saying, you know, that's what their faith teaches them. They're, they're moving on in life. But what was interesting, that's the, that simple act of forgiveness led to the Confederate flag, the, the governor, Nikki Haley, and the, and the legislature getting rid of the Confederate flag, which was on the South Carolina flag, believe it or not, still. So that powerful sentiment of forgiveness did more than all the other, you know, energy that was focused on trying to get rid of that, that flag for, for decades and decades. So, so, you know, I think everybody has to figure it out for themselves. I, I think for me, it does bad things when I don't forgive. That's a very, another very even handed response, difficult one, but interesting to hear about the idea of the energy from it rippling out, I suppose, and, and having unintended positive effects as well as helping the person who. Yeah. And, and you know, the other thing is, um, it's funny, those of us who have children, I, I remember reading this book two years ago by uh, the head of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. He said, I've got some good news and bad news. He was kind of pulling together his life work. He said, I got some good news and bad news for those of you that have children. He said, first, the bad news. All the things you've tried to teach your kids, none of it matters. It doesn't matter. He said, there's only one thing that matters, how you've lived. So that's scary and encouraging <laughs> because people follow people. You know, the, so a CEO said to me, Doug, what's the best thing I can do for my company? I said, the best thing you can do is be the most evolved person you can be and the most whole person. That will set a tone for everything else. It's not words. Words don't change anybody. It's like the poet laureate Maya Angelou said this. She said, people are not going to remember what you said or what you did. They will remember how they felt when they were with you. If you're authentic and working on yourself, the greatest thing my three boys want to know is, what's your biggest project, Doug? And it's me. My biggest project is me. It's not to fix them. I tried to fix them. That program doesn't work. So I've worked. Uh, I think the best thing I can do is try to be the most evolved and whole person possible. And there's another question from Eleanor saying, given your time spent in deliberate isolation and the benefits that you gained from it, what are your thoughts on the solitary confinement of those in the American prison system? I think solitary confinement is the cruelest thing that you can do to a human being. Because it's not self-chosen. Now, I know that there are people that have been in solitary confinement that, that get transformed, but most of them go mentally ill. I think it's the cruelest punishment you can inflict upon a person. So again, there, there are so many nuances. If somebody's forced into that, it's unlikely to be something that is life-changing in a good sense for them, unless certainly some have, have enabled it to be. I, I'm amazed at some of these people that come out of being 42 years in prison 
and the DNA proved that they were not guilty of what they were charged with. And some of these people are amazingly evolved and grounded. And others, it's been a poison that just corroded their souls. So, uh, yeah, I'm solitary confinement. That's very different. <laughs> it's got to be, you got to choose. You got to, it's got to be something you choose. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions. I hope I didn't destroy your series. It might be the one and last one. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I was just going to thank you very much for your insightful and nuanced uh, discussion of the ideas in your book and of being so generous with your time with the, the Q&As. And I think we covered some really interesting topics there. So that was fantastic. And shameless plug on Doug's behalf, he hasn't asked me to do this, but this is the book in question, Rethinking Success, Eight Essential Practices for Finding Meaning in Work and Life, available from all good booksellers. And if you're a current member of Trinity, we also have copies in the library available for you to borrow as well. Our next Trinity talk, speaking of uh, shameless plugs, the Trinity Tones talk, is on Monday 22nd of March, where Tristan Franklinus, one of our uh, junior research fellows and classics lecturers, will be talking about the Codex Puranus manuscript. So thank you once again to Doug, and thank you all for attending and for your involvement in the Q&A session. And uh, I hope to see you again at our next talk. <laughs>